hello. Today we're not out in the country but in the heart of Newcastle and we're going to look at some old familiar buildings, buildings that you'll recognise but I hope that through the eyes of our camera you'll be seeing them in a, a new way. They're old buildings, uh, they're old friends you might say, if buildings can be friends and I think they can be. Up here on Nobby's Breakwater where we're setting out on our little walk around Newcastle today, I've got with me three fellows who uh, spent quite a bit of time looking into the fascinating history of, of Newcastle. There's Doug Lithgow, who's the president of the Hunter Manning National Parks Association. Uh, Brian Suters, who's a well-known local architect in Newcastle. And Jeff Stevenson, who's the chairman of the National Trust Historic Buildings Committee for the Newcastle area. They're the experts. Uh, I'm just coming along for the walk. And uh, I hope that with our camera crew, you'll join us in a journey through the heart of a city. We'll have a look at uh, Nobby's as it is today and as it was and the breakwater and Fort Scratchley. Uh, probably many of you have never seen into Fort Scratchley. Well, we'll, have, we'll be able to see what's there and we'll have a look at some of the terrace housing at Newcastle East and uh, some of the other historic buildings. We'll be moving on to have a look at the Bond store in Telford Street the fine Newcastle Customs House which has been magnificently preserved and then moving over the road to have a look at the Newcastle Railway Station and I guess many of you have come into town on the trains at times but probably just never taken the opportunity to have a look at this fine old building. As an architect I'm interested in buildings and I'd like to share some of that interest with you today. Uh, we're going to look at buildings such as the uh, Longworth Institute, the uh, Post Office and Police Station Group, and finally we're going to look at the Wood Street Tech Building. Now all these buildings not only have an architectural quality, but they also reflect something of the social and historical uh, character of the city and its development. Well, we start our journey with Doug Lithgow describing the earliest journey of all, Captain Cook coming up the New South Wales coast in 1770. log on the May the 10th 1770 described the island as a small clump of an island lying close inshore. When Cook noted this in his log the island was twice its present height that is 203 feet high. The removal of this most distinctive uh, landmark caused a storm of public protest naturally and uh, after and the demolition was halted after a public protest meeting held in Newcastle on June the 21st 1854. Sh sailing ships as they came under the lee of the island would lose uh, sa uh, steering way and drift across onto the oyster banks. The development of the steamship has uh, made it quite uh, unnecessary to re remove nobbies and in fact uh, uh, today, Nobbies is used as a signal station in fact, uh, and an aid to navigation. Nobbies, unfortunately, has never had the care that was truly due to it as the symbol of Newcastle. Uh, and nor has uh, Macquarie's Pier, which connects uh, Nobbies Island with the mainland, been looked after in any way by the authorities. Uh, e even now, you can see the old uh, stonework how it's been uh, mutilated by the dumping of rubbish and uh, in other places uh, the dimension stonework which shows the marks of the uh, stonemasons scutch has been covered over with in a very rude way with uh, just ugly concrete from in, from right in the heart of the city in Market Street you can look across the harbour the busy harbour and see Nobby's Indeed, it's a symbol of Newcastle Nobbies and was for many years on the uh, coat of arms, the council's coat of arms. Nobbies, unfortunately, has never had the care that was truly due to it as the symbol of Newcastle. What really is needed is uh, a comprehensive uh, plan which tries to uh, maintain the, the uh, integrity of the, the landscape and uh, add to the dignity that it really deserves.
Batman's Row is an excellent example of terrace, English terrace, terrace architecture. Its simple lines are uh, really quite exquisite. And it was this building was built in 1892 to house the rowers that manned the uh, the lifeboats that went out to save uh, ships off Newcastle in heavy storms. But on the other side of the street, we have Port Scratchley. From the earliest days, guns were in position on this hill, which was known as Allen's Hill at the time. Uh, and um, it was originally the uh, harbour master's, the site of the harbour master's cottage. Uh, a beacon was established on the hill uh, in 1822, which was fired from coal, which was actually mined from underneath the beacon. Uh, and Newcastle's first export of coal was taken from Allen's Hill in 1799. Nobbies, the breakwater, uh, the boatman's row and the area of the uh, uh, foreshore there, comprise a most distinctive uh, historic area. Unfortunately, in the three years that's elapsed since the army moved out, that the whole thing has just gone to rack and ruin. And whereas the uh, city could have had a, uh, a group of buildings in working order, we now find that it would cost, you know, a small fortune just to bring them back to their original condition. Uh, I would see it being used as, you know, an arts and crafts centre and uh, possibly as small museums and for different um, interests of a public nature. The building was originally constructed in 1888 for the Yerp Gillam Company. It was designed by Frederick Menkins, a noted Newcastle architect, some six years after his arrival in Newcastle in 1882, uh, from Adelaide after he had immigrated from Germany in uh, 1878. His home and technical training uh, had been in an area famous over the centuries for its brick, brick buildings, and hence you find here the use of polychromatic brickwork, for which North German architecture is well noted. The building is quite large for a single bomb store building, being some floors, uh, some four floors in height. It was uh, very conveniently located uh, for a bomb store, being handy to the wharf, the railway tracks, and also to the customs house. One of the interesting features of this building is, of course, that um, one of the owners, Mr. Earp, was a Dutchman. The builder, John Straub, was a Dutchman, and this probably led to the uh, carved keystone over the main entrance, which is reputed to be of a Dutch princess. Unfortunately, this building has been very much neglected, and uh, some years ago, the parapet and pediment were destroyed in a fire, and, has been, and have been replaced by a very unsympathetic uh, asbestos fascia. As you can see, the building has deteriorated uh, through fretting of label moulds and brickwork, and uh, the worst of the lot is the way in which the uh, window reveals and sills have been uh, blown out literally by the expansion of the uh, rusting uh, uh, grill bars that originally uh, protected these windows. However, dis despite all of these faults, the building, I think, is in uh, structurally quite good condition, and while it would require a very big effort to restore it, um, I don't think it's sort of beyond the point of no return. The trucks could enter from the uh, wharf area at the lower level, which you can see down here just adjacent to the present shunting yards, and of course goods could be brought in or taken away from either the Telford Street or the uh, Bond Street level, which is in actual fact one floor higher. Um, 
there were gantries over each doorway so that goods could be lifted directly from the trucks and, and uh, placed in any floor uh, as desired. The two main sides of the building aren't parallel and they uh, taper down towards the customs house. I think that this building uh, in this location uh, and being on the edge of the uh, recreation or the proposed recreation area on the site of the shunting yards would naturally lend itself to some sort of public or semi-public uh, use or, or some semi-institutional use such as a museum and of course its vast size would make it absolutely ideal. Buildings of, of this of this size are just hard to come by. The Customs House was constructed in 1876 by James Barnett, um, one of the uh, government architects at the time. The front facade, uh, which is to Bond Street, has an asymmetrical composition which has been greatly influenced by Italian public buildings, which Barnett himself was strongly influenced by. Here again, as in the um, Bond store, you can see the uh, use of contrasting brick colours, which uh, actually greatly influenced both English and Australian architects of that period. You can note in particular the use of salmon and light yellow bricks, and in particular the use of black and uh, light yellow bricks alternatively to form the uh, window heads. The Customs House Tower in itself uh, is, is something of a curious mixture of uh, North uh, Italian medieval architecture up to about the level of the clock and then from there on it tends to become more Baroque. The interior of this building is of course typical of um, the 19th century um, historicism in architecture in that it bears no relationship whatsoever to the exterior of the building. Uh, for example, the fine corbel bay window which uh, forms the pivot point around which the whole design is balanced uh, had nothing behind it originally apart from a small office which was reputed to be the uh, harbour master's office and I think now it's just the men's change room. In uh, 1899 there was a northern wing added in a very sympathetic manner and I think it's uh, it shows, this building shows, you know, how it's quite possible to add or to alter a building, you know, without ne necessarily destroying the original concept of the building. I think one of the most interesting uh, points of the building is the little spire atop the tower which, as you'll notice, has a, a ball on it which used to drop at exactly 1pm each day to allow the masters of ships in port to set their chronometers. This was, uh, I believe, also matched by the firing of a cannon on uh, Flagstaff Hill, uh, now Fort Scratchley, of course, uh, at, at precisely the same time. Uh, I think the, um, the only way in which this uh, building has been destroyed is, is not so much in the building itself but in the grounds and the uh, works around it. Um, there's been a, uh, a tar paved uh, car park located directly in front of it now and the old uh, wrought iron railing which uh, was of course a feature of the design uh, is now missing. I think this, this building must be a shining example of how a building over a hundred years old you know, can still be maintained in near perfect condition and, and can still render useful service. The Newcastle Railway Station in its original form was uh, completed around about 1872. It was a very functional concept like that of its contemporaries in New South Wales. But the, what, the most interesting uh, point of the station was that it was designed as a one-sided station consisting of a long, narrow complex of buildings with a single platform on one side and a street on the other. This is very unusual because normally for a terminus station such as Newcastle, a terminus station building was erected at the very end of the uh, railway line with platforms uh, coming out to give level access um, from the building. Uh, this type of building you see in, in, of course, the 20th century Sydney uh, Central Station. The design of the building is, of course, as conservative as the general station plan. Uh, the building plan was, rig was rigidly symmetrical with a central block housing the booking office, which you can still see in the centre. 
and with various waiting rooms and refreshment rooms on either side which are again flanked by wings containing ladies waiting rooms and, and a larger refreshment room and, and then further uh, out on, on either side of the central axis were, were toilets and then again um, various office buildings housing um, railway uh, functions and, uh, and offices etc. Because this strong symmetrical arrangement was fairly typical of classical uh, English uh, railway stations of the 1840s. Originally, of course, it was a, a very beautiful building, but uh, such rigid planning it is difficult to enlarge or adapt. Uh, if, of course, it had been a terminus uh, station, uh, there would have been more land available, uh, and uh, therefore the, the planning could have been much more flexible. However, by 1896, it was already found to be uh, far too small. Uh, at the western end, uh, the, uh, the only two-storey building that you can see there at the western end, uh, was altered to provide an enlarged refreshment area and a kitchen complex as well on the ground floor. And the upper floor was converted uh, or, or constructed uh, to house uh, overnight accommodation. Of course, whilst the designer abandoned the symmetry of the, uh, of the whole station, he did make some effort to try and keep the new work in harmony with the existing. The whole complex was completely linked together by a veranda which in uh, was held up by some very elaborative and, and, and very uh, decorative uh, cast iron brackets that, uh, that you can see uh, along the platform. I'm now standing here at the railway station, uh, if one looks across the road, uh, in amongst the sort of the mess of modern buildings one has uh, a glimpse of a rather magnificent uh, Baroque building. Uh, no doubt many weary travellers as they enter Newcastle uh, seek uh, some sort of relief to the, uh, the grime and uh, uh, derelict sort of conditions and it's only a matter of looking across the road and we see this Longworth Institute. Now, it's a very uh, exciting building because this uh, building was uh, designed by Frederick Menkins. And again, uh, probably most people would say, who's Frederick Menkins? Well, as an architect, uh, I'm very conscious of Frederick Menkins because he, uh, he did a lot in this city. He came here in 1882 uh, with very little uh, backing except his own ability. And uh, in the space of... Uh, or well, 25 years from 1882 to 1908 he built up a magnificent practice and this building that we see here opposite uh, represents sort of the high point of his career um, it's a baroque building uh, it's it's the sort of thing that Menkins would uh, dearly love to do and obviously he had in this particular patron the uh, the ideal client a man of some sort of sensitivity He's allowed the architect the, the chance to sort of show his uh, ability and to, um, to give to the citizens of Newcastle something really worthwhile. Um, it's, a, it's a Baroque building. Uh, it derives its in inspiration from Germany where Menkins was born. It's got beautiful detail work in it. Uh, you know, as you sort of gaze up the building and look there, you see the heroic figures of Hercules and Atlas striving to uh, hold up the uh, beautiful uh, cantilevered oriel windows. Then as you uh, continue gaze up, you see uh, the uh, striking figure of commerce holding the sphere, which, you know, one would like to think symbolizes the uh, prosperity of the city. There's a lot that, you know, that you can see in this building, you know, and uh, the tragedy of it is that, uh, you know, we tend to just pass it by and not see it and uh, if we look at this example we see that we've combined here the uh, the commercial with the aesthetic. Uh, Mr Woods obviously took some pride in the, the buildings that he had built for him. Uh, he's allowed the architect to to use his art. He's allowed um, well, the architect to express the spirit of the age. It's, the building is in the uh, this, the ruling uh, style that was uh, 
abroad at the time. It was the it's a Queen Anne building, and um, it shows that uh, within sort of the commercial development, it's still possible to have some sort of respect for things that are beautiful. This group of uh, three buildings here is uh, very important to Newcastle. It's, uh, it is unique. It's unique to Newcastle. It's almost uh, unique to New South Wales and perhaps to Australia because here in this precinct we have uh, three buildings by three different government architects uh, spanning a um, well over half a century. Um, we've got, uh, starting say from the post office corner here, we have uh, a building in high renaissance style designed by the government architect uh, uh, Vernon, um, Walter Liberty Vernon, no, no less. Uh, he, um, he was the, the government architect at the time. He was obviously uh, impressed by the Italianate style. It's uh, a replica of uh, Palladium architecture, which was all the rage at that time. It's a beautiful example. It's beautifully built. It's, uh, there's loving details. There's, uh, the craftsmanship is excellent. Uh, you know, as we looked along the floor here, you see this beautiful mosaic pattern of, uh, of uh, sort of a living example of craftsmanship. Uh, you know, it, we only have to sort of compare it with what's been done later. You know, out on the footpath, we see the, the crudity of our attempts at uh, patching up pavements. Uh, you know, it's, it's well for us to to compare these things and just see how insensitive we are today. Now, if we go further down, we've got the uh, police station, which uh, is an example of Mortimer Lewis's work. It was built uh, initially as a single-storey building back in 1840. Later on, uh, it was extended to a two-storey building and the second storey was added by Vernon. Um, it's a fairly simple uh, colonial building and uh, the contrast is quite marked uh, between the, the richness of the palladium architecture of the post office and the simplicity of the uh, colonial architecture. Then further along we've got the, uh, the group which we now call the uh, Public Works Department which is actually linked with the uh, CIB. Now here we've got an example of um, uh, James Barnett's work. Um, another government architect. Um, the building on the corner was uh, originally a post office. Here we've got an example of, uh, of two buildings uh, built at different periods. Um, there's been an attempt to link them up. We, if you look along you'll see a string course uh, which connects the, uh, the old post office building with the, the CIB building. Uh, there's been modification to the original post office building. The, the Gothic windows have been uh, changed to a round arch and the keystones have been uh, elongated to link up with a string line. The, um, the whole, the two, two buildings, I mean to the average person looking at them they look like they would have been built at the same time. But it's such, that's a, uh, a compliment to the Arctic because he's, um, he's been able to marry the two together. He's not uh, destroyed one in, uh, in putting the other there. And, you know, so often we look around the city and you see uh, how, how much we destroy the, the things around us by just an insensitive approach to, uh, to building and to, uh, and to the texture of the city. One of the uh, problems that architects and preservation groups face is that there, there are no, uh, there's no legislation to protect buildings from demolition. One... Uh, if one thinks that uh, a building needs to be demolished for some new work, well then all one has to do is, is com conform with the uh, DLI requirements and go ahead and demolish. But you don't need a building permit or any form of permit. I think it's essential if we're going to protect our environment and our city from destruction to have some sort of early, early warning device. Uh, there should be it should be necessary to obtain a permit before one demolishes a building which is of 
public value. Um, then at least uh, having gone through the process of obtaining some sort of permit, people become aware and then the case can be put by the citizens to, uh, to try and preserve or to uh, modify the development so that it's in accord with the, uh, the overall character and feel of the city. You know, here we've got the uh, post office, we've got the, uh, the police and we have the public works department. Those three bodies should be able to combine to see that this, this unique precinct is preserved. I, I think uh, most p people realise that uh, the public works department and the police station is threatened. There's a proposal to have a state office block on, on this site. Now, you know, we're not that short of sites in Newcastle that we can afford to pull down these, these buildings. If we pull them down, well then that's the end. We can never recreate it and what we've destroyed is something that is unique, that, uh, that not only our generation should see, should see the colonial, the, uh, the Baroque, the uh, High Renaissance, all these things that can be seen as a sort of a living example of architecture and of art. This building's important because it's, it's a brewery building built for uh, the brewery industry. It, uh, it's a, a warehouse building. Uh, it's a solid construction. It's, uh, it's the sort of building one would see around uh, waterfronts uh, in London, Liverpool. Uh, it still has a, a little bit of architectural flair in it. It's got a sort of French uh, revival style in, in the dome on the top. There's a subtlety in colour in the brickwork. There's a change of, uh, of tone in the brickwork over the arches to the surrounding sort of browns of the, the main walls. There's the change in the, uh, the heads of the windows. We have uh, the flat arches con contrasted with the round arches. We've got the, the vertical accent on, of the tower. In the early days, it was considered to be a, a worthy rival to the customs house. A contemporary report in the Chronicle, uh, around about 1876 or 1878, there's a reference made that on a clear sunny day, one can gaze from the hill of Newcastle and and see the uh, the tower of the Wood Street uh, of the Castle Main Brewery building, vying for for prominence with the uh, Customs House tower. The pressure to demolish is, is, is related to the, the function of the building. I'm told that the uh, education department or the T Department of Technical Education say that there is a waterproofing problem, that the water comes through the solid brickwork. Now, it, it wouldn't take a great deal to be able to overcome that problem and perhaps put a, an, an internal uh, skin to form a cavity. It's almost... Uh, hard to imagine why people want to demolish this building. The only reason that I could think is that it's a matter of prestige, that in, uh, in developments where, with one government department vying against another one, there is sort of prestige in having new buildings. But, uh, you know, I think it's, it's worthwhile putting the point over that there can be more prestige in preserving buildings and incorporating old buildings with new buildings. I think that, that's more praiseworthy than having just new buildings which uh, don't uh, show the, the fabric of the city. I think the chances of saving Wood Street are, are very remote. I think in the order of 100 to 1. You see the, the processes that are necessary in uh, creating new buildings have proceeded and uh, drawings are being done, surveys are being done, there are lots, there's lots of money being expended in preparing plans so that it's going to be, take a tremendous amount of pressure to, to stop that process. I think the only way that these buildings could be saved now is by public pressure, by the people saying that we, we don't want our city destroyed, we want to retain our heritage, we, we place a great deal of importance on the, uh, the character that these buildings give to our city. And it's only through public pressure that these buildings will be saved. In just the same way as in 1850, public pressure uh, came to bear to present, prevent uh, Nobby's being uh, demolished down to sea level. Same thing happened in, uh, in the 60s with Blackbutt. It was public pressure that's prevented the road going through the park. <laughs>
and that's the only way I see that uh, that these buildings could be saved.